Good morning, this is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. These are the stories that set your agenda. The strike continues. Boeing workers reject the latest wage deal to end a crippling stoppage. The embattled plane maker warns it expects to keep burning cash next year. Tesla shares saw post markets after its most profitable quarter in more than a year. Elon Musk promises ride-sharing services in Texas and California as soon as next year. Plus, a dead heat in the swing states. Our latest poll shows Donald Trump and Kamala Harris neck and neck less than two weeks from the election. We will have the details. Another big day on the earnings front, then Renault, and this is crucial, maintaining its full year guidance. That's after some of its rivals. Think of Stellantis, think of BMW and VW cut their full year guidance. Renault is maintaining its full year guidance. Coming through as well with third quarter revenue just below the estimates, 10.7 billion euros versus the estimates of 10.9 billion euros. Renault still seeing full year operating margins of at least 7.5%. They had been expected to come in and expected to see those margins of around 7.8%. So in terms of the view on margins coming in a little softer, but again, in terms of the full year guidance that is being maintained by Renault, the stock up around 14% year to date. When it comes to BE Semiconductor, the maker then of the packaging around many of these chips that are being manufactured, third quarter revenue coming in at 156 million euros. That's above the estimates of 152 million euros. So on the top level, third quarter revenue for BE Semiconductor based in the Netherlands, it's a beat. In terms of the gross margin, a little softer than the estimates. Marginally, 64.7% is the gross margin. The estimates had been for 65 point one percent that stock is down a little over 20 percent year to date the inventory buildup in the broader semiconductor space has weighed on be semiconductor but again top line it's a modest beat coming through for that dutch chip equipment maker let's check in on these markets then yes the earnings story is certainly part of the calculation for investors you had the sell-off yesterday in u.s stocks you may get a rebound today though on the optimism that's come through from the beat of tesla concerns around boeing of course with members voting against that latest deal so that could be a drag. Currently, European futures are pointing low, just modestly by a tenth of a percent after dropping three tenths yesterday. FTSE 100 futures, though, in positive territory, pointing up by two tenths of a percent. S&P futures also looking to gain, adding 10 points so far in the session. NASDAQ futures, NASDAQ 100 futures looking to add five tenths of a percent and certainly a hat tip to Tesla on that front. Let's cross uh, over to the cross asset board and flip the board and have a look at what's happening in the treasuries because you've seen a bit of a respite in terms of the bond sell-off and the treasury sell-off. In fact, yields are currently down three basis points. So a bit of money moving into the benchmark US 10-year right now, 421 again after the sell-off that we've seen that has been pronounced. Euro dollar 107. You're seeing softer dollar in the session today. That's helping a number of currencies, including the single currency of the eurozone currently up a tenth of percent. The pound in focus, given comments from BOE Governor Andrew Bailey on the inflation trajectory, more progress that he's seen there and suggesting, hinting that there are further cuts to come from the Bank of England after they stand in pat in September. Currently 129 on the pound, $75 a barrel on Brent. Oil is up 1.2 percent. The eye still, of course, on the Middle East crisis. Let's get to a corporate crisis right now, though, because Boeing workers will remain on strike after their union rejected the company's latest contract offer, which would have increased their wages by 30 Five percent. That's over a four year period. Sixty four percent of members voted against the deal with the union president taking aim at the company. It just wasn't enough for our members. We couldn't reach, especially when it's been 16 years since we've had a chance to bargain every area of our contract. And trying to make all that up in one is very hard to do. But our members deserve more. They've spoken loudly and we're going to go back to the table to try to achieve those things. Let's bring in Bloomberg Asia Transport reporter Danny Lee, who's been following all of this for us from the outset. Danny, we know this is a blow for Boeing, but how big a blow is this? It's a bitter blow given how much going into this vote, the prospect, uh, the high prospect of potentially this deal being passed and the number of union workers rejecting this outright. And so you have to then look at what is the number? What is the number that will allow union members to 
vote through uh, the next kind of vote and the next kind of offer on the table. Now, we heard from John Holden saying that you know, the biggest sticking point is still on defined benefit pensions, something that is more generous in nature and corporations have generally phased this out. And so you know, if the 40% in wage rises that the union originally wanted, uh, could they offer a lot more in order to not offer changes, including bringing back the defined benefit? benefit pensions. And so for now, for Boeing, this is a real frustration back to square one here. And it elevates the risk and the prolonged nature of the strike that they could see their uh, their ratings uh, downgraded to junk. And that's something that they would definitely want to avoid, given all the things they need to try and do to get this business back on track. OK, so the rating downgrades is is a risk. We know the cash burn will continue into 2025. That's what we heard from executives yesterday. What happens next? when it comes to this labour strife for Boeing? Well, clearly Boeing and the union are going to have to get back to the negotiating table quite quickly. But in the meantime, with the, uh, the lack of production, the lack of output, uh, this you know, will further strain Boeing and its finances. Yes, they have taken steps to try and shore up its uh, defences on, on the financial front. But still, the fact that Boeing has got a whole slew of issues that Kelly Otberg, the new CEO, wants to do to try and restructure this business wholesale, uh, this strike is one thing it would rather see off its chest. Bloomberg Asia Transport reporter Danny Lee on another challenging day then for Boeing, uh, with members not voting in favour of that latest deal. And Danny will keep us across that story, of course, as it continues to unfold. Danny, thank you to Tesla now and a very different story here. Some optimism, some positivity when it comes to the Tesla story. Shares have jumped in late trading after a surprise blowout quarter. CEO Elon Musk added $80 billion to the company's market value after strong quarterly earnings driven by cyber truck sales. Musk also laid out his plans to roll out ride sharing next year. I think we should get approval next year, but, it, but it's contingent upon regulatory approval. Uh, Texas is um, a lot faster, so it's, uh, can I say, like, we're, um, we'll definitely have available in Texas. Um, and probably have it available in, in, in California, subject to reg regulatory approval. Um, and then, and, and maybe some other states actually um, next year as well. Okay, join me now is Katrina Nicholas, Bloomberg's transport editor based out in Asia. Uh, Katrina, break down the numbers for us when it comes to the Tesla earnings, a beat in terms of the top line, and a view as well on volumes. Yeah, well, this was really a, a blowout quarter for the electric car maker. It's most profitable results in, in more than a year. Third quarter earnings were really buoyed by sales of the Cybertruck, which turned a profit for the first time. Tesla's energy storage business and also a spike in those regulatory tax credits that other automakers pay to meet their own emissions rules. For the third quarter, Tesla reported adjusted earnings of 72% share. That was above what analysts were looking for. And importantly, the company's third quarter automotive growth margin, excluding those regulatory tax credits, came in at 17.1%. Now, that was well above the 14.6% it was the previous quarter. I think expectations were quite low coming into this set of numbers. I mean, after four consecutive um, bottom line misses we've had from Tesla and a pretty lacklustre, uh, you know, robo-taxi investor day just the other uh, couple of weeks back, uh, which left, I think, investors quite underwhelmed and certainly with more questions and answers. So Elon Musk certainly seems to have delivered the goods uh, in this set of numbers. He's delivered them in this set of numbers, Katrina. Is he going to deliver on some of these bold and ambitious plans when it comes to next year? And he laid out that vision for investors. But, of course, historically, we've known we've got to take some of this with a pinch of salt. How do investors read the comments as he projects into next year? Yeah, well, that, that's exactly right. I mean, like any Tesla presentation, there were lots of high-level promises. And indeed, you know, Musk spent a long portion of the earnings call talking about how he's going to make Tesla the most invaluable company in the world, uh, starting with delivery growth uh, next year of somewhere between 20 to 30 percent. He also said that Tesla aims to officially roll out ride sharing in Texas and California next year. Uh, there was talk about the robo-taxi and some of the production volumes that we might expect to see about 
about that. This is what he's calling the cyber cab. Um, he was saying that volume productions should be, uh, you know, well into the swing of things by 2026. He's talking about, you know, numbers of perhaps 2 million units, you know, ultimately 4 million perhaps. Uh, he also spoke a little bit about this uh, more affordable model. Uh, he sort of disabused the long-held expectations that some investors have about uh, an electric vehicle that might go up against some mass market cars like you know, Toyota Corolla and price in about the $25,000 mark. He said, you know, that probably would, would, be, would be pointless. But certainly he was talking a lot about the cyber cab, the autonomous cyber cab, which is probably expected to come in at about the $30,000 price point. Now, look, Musk, as you said, is, is known to make promises that he doesn't always deliver on. But certainly investors seem to be happy um, sending shares up in post-market trading about 12%, which is uh, raising the 14% gains potentially so far this year. So um, certainly investors, at least for now, are, are, are seeing, you know, believing what Musk is saying. OK, Katrina Nicholas, thank you very much indeed in terms of the earnings coming through from Tesla and looking ahead as well into 2025. And so whether or not those plans actually materialise for Musk and co. Uh, let's check in another earnings story right now. It is the lender over in the Scandinavian space, SEB, of course, Sweden, coming through uh, with a miss when it comes to net interest income in the third quarter. Net interest income coming in at just over 11 uh, billion Swedish kroner, 11.06 billion Swedish kroner. The estimates have been for 11.3 billion Swedish kroner. So at least on net interest income, a key gauge, of course, for these lenders, uh, slightly softer than uh, the estimates. And in terms of provisions in the third quarter uh, for credit losses, that's come in just shy of 400 million Swedish kroner. Net interest income, again, a little bit softer, operating profit of 11.8 billion Swedish kroner. That stock, by the way, up about 22 percent year to date. Let's get a check on the Asian markets right now. Crossover to Avril Hong standing by for us in Singapore. Avril, what are you looking at? Yeah, we're looking at how despite solid earnings, whether you're talking about Tesla or SK Hynix, that is failing to ease concerns two weeks out of the US election. The region's benchmark today headed for its fourth session of declines. Uh, and that is despite what we see from the likes of SK Hynix, record profit powered by AI demand. And that really tells you what investors are concerned about, especially with China reversing gains from a day ago as those lingering concerns about the Chinese economy way. We've been talking about this a lot, Tom, whether that Chinese stock rebound momentum can be sustained into the US election today looks like it can't. We are seeing, though, the Japanese currency managing to snap a three-session losing streak. Let's put the board, take a closer look at it. It is receiving a boost from the Japanese finance minister today talking about one-sided rapid moves. That's clearly something they don't want to see. And of course, they are monitoring things with a greater sense of urgency. If there were to be actual intervention. Remember, this is the guy who is going to be calling for it when uh, after that the BOJ will be the one that executes. So his words do carry weight. And this is why we're seeing that gain on the yen today. Tom. OK, Avril Hong in Singapore, which we build up, of course, the election in Japan, general election over the weekend. Avril, thank you very much indeed. Now, European PMI is due today. I'd like you to attract more attention than normal markets. We'll look to the data as a gauge of how quickly the economic outlook is deteriorating in the eurozone. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Valerie Titel for a gauge on what to expect and how the markets are gearing up around this data. Valerie, what do we expect? How consequential could it be? Is it going to be repricing in terms of expectations around the ECB? Uh, look, Tom, a lot of ECB members ha have commented recently that they'll be relying on the data as to whether they go for a jumbo cut in December of 50 basis points. So today's print will attract a lot of attention from the market. I just want to go back and talk about just how badly they deteriorated in last month's print. Last month was the first month we saw the composite indicator for the eurozone. That's this purple line here fall into contraction. We also saw a steep decline from France uh, in last month's print. That was mostly uh, the effects of after uh, the Olympics. But all three Three composite indicators are in contraction uh, after last month's print. And let's look at what we can expect in my next uh, on my next uh, table uh, for today's print. The only subcomponent that is currently uh, in expansion is German services. Now, it's expected to hold at 50.6, just slightly in expansionatory territory, but I would have my eye on that one. Any downside surprise in German services, I think, could prompt further dovish language from the ECB. And we have gotten a lot of dovish language and some hawkish comments from ECB members 
as they speak alongside the IMF uh, yesterday. We also had a report out from Reuters yesterday that mentioned that ECB Governing Council is beginning to debate if they need to lower rates below neutral. We heard some similar comments from Panetta yesterday saying he can't exclude that the ECB must be, go below neutral. We also heard some more hawkish comments down here at the bottom. Uh, one of them from uh, Class Knot talking about how the market pricing of cuts is too aggressive. We could see what um, we could see some uh, evidence in the data today on whether the market pricing for that jumbo cut from the ECB is validated. The market is currently pricing in a 40 percent chance that we do get that 50 percent cut from the ECB in December. There we go. 40 percent chance of a 50 basis point cut from the ECB in December. Robert Holtzman, interestingly, of course, the Austrian Central Bank. So on the hawkish side, suggesting that that wouldn't be appropriate at this stage, but certainly keeping the open uh, door open to 25 basis points uh, from, from the, uh, the Austrian Central Bank governor. That was interesting. Valerie Titel, thank you very much indeed with a preview of that PMI data, the consequential nature of it, what it could mean, of course, for the ECB and the Eurozone. Thank you. Coming up, Donald Trump, Kamala Harris in a dead heat in the race for the White House. We discuss the details of our new poll. That is next. And later on, we're going to speak exclusively with the CEOs of Equinor and Dassault Systems on their company's earnings. When it comes to Equinor, really interesting stories around the gas outlook for Europe, investments in the renewable space and for Dassault Systems, the software demand across multiple different sectors. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Now, the latest Bloomberg News morning consult opinion poll shows Donald Trump and Kamala Harris locked in a dead heat. Less than two weeks out, of course, from polling day in the U.S. Let's bring in Bloomberg's opening trade anchor, Kriti Gupta, who has the latest for us and what this poll means. How significant is this poll? I mean, it's a dead heat. We've kind of known that for a while, but this is focused on the swing states. So that's important as well. It is. Well, in the latest morning consult data alongside Bloomberg, you are seeing that Kamala Harris has a lead in a lot of these swing states. Nevada, Arizona, Michigan, for example. Michigan is the unsurprising one, given that, of course, she's been courting the labor vote pretty aggressively. So we know that uh, kind of exposure to the auto sector is working in her favor. But broadly, it is still a neck and neck race simply because the march of error could swing in either direction. So this idea here simply being that a voter turnout could, could sway the polls, that anything could happen, is still very much in play. But you can see even on the map that three out of the seven swing states Trump has the lead in, at least his latest data, and four uh, is, is, is Harris. And again, all within the margin of error. So, OK, so how many of those swing states uh, do you need to, to, to get across the line when, when it comes to the comes that total uh, number of votes? I mean, there's the national vote, which is arguably less important yeah. than the swing states. So how many of those states do you need in the bag? And what, what are the strategies for the campaigns likely to, to, to be in the days ahead? So uh, to answer your first question, the number of swing states really depends on which combination of swing states, mm. because the electoral votes are pretty spread out alongside. So again, popular vote doesn't matter as much as it would in a traditional democracy. For example, you do have to count the electoral and then it, ca it all kind of adds up. At the moment, it's those electoral votes right now in, the fa in those four swing states that we just outline that's giving Kamala Harris the lead. But again, if that switches or swings, for lack of a better term, that could all pivot. And then again, it's the combination of the states uh, that actually matters. To your latter question around strategy, this is really why President Trump, the former President Trump and Republican candidate, is going to Nevada and Arizona today because he's trying to court those votes. That's where he's lagging in the polls uh, most with Kamala Harris. He's already kind of given up the Michigan, it feels like, given that he had already tried to court the labor vote. Two out of the three major trade unions in the United States endorsed Kamala Harris very traditional, in line with what you've seen with Democratic parties. But he did try to get there. Now he's spreading out. He's going to Nevada. He's going to Arizona. Pennsylvania remains the kind of a key sticking point because that's where the polling has gone back and forth between the two and swung the most. We, of course, know that uh, Trump had the biggest lead there. It is then reversed mm. to Kamala Harris. But again, it's closing the gap. So I mean, uh, I don't know how much you learned from this hit, Tom, but I think anything can lot. happen. So there's, there's, and there's a lot of electoral, electoral votes, college, electoral college votes in Pennsylvania, yeah. aren't there? Uh, it's, so, that, so that's really consequential. Um, talk to us about how should investors be thinking, do you think, about the risks of 
no decisive call on this election come November the 6th, that this goes to a legal wrangling between the two parties. How, how salient do you think is that risk at this point? It's a very uh, real risk because, one, simply we're going to see a lag in terms of how many ballots are counted. We want to really uh, kind of limit the risk. And when I say we, I mean, of course, the United States uh, and, and the electoral officials that, that do this. Limit the risk of any sort of miscounting or fraud, et cetera. We know this took a while in terms of the legal battle in the Supreme Court back in the 2000 election. We also know that it took about a week uh, between Joe Biden and Donald Trump in the 2020 election as well. A lot of that had to do with COVID and safety regulations as well. But this time with the amount of turnout and the amount of voting and the amount of political pressure, because of course you do have the also the risk of not just the lags that you're going to see, but the political violence that could follow depending on who is elected. That's where you start to get very tricky. So when it comes to the markets, the idea that I think consistently I've heard from the investment community has been the long vol trade is one that you can't put on enough simply because this could be uh, not only in terms of counting, but in terms of the political reaction, the domestic violence that follows, that could last for weeks, if not months. OK, that is that is quite a prospect, isn't it? As lawyers on both sides uh, gear up for a potential legal fight on the back of uh, this election. Kriti Gupta, thank you very much indeed. Open trade anchor, of course, on the run up to that U.S. election. Coming up, we're going to speak with the CEOs of Equinor and Dassault Systems as we turn our attention back to the corporate earnings uh, stories. We're going to get their reaction to the numbers and the outlook for both of those companies. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. We will suffer overall. Welfare will improve less uh, as not only will if the U.S. puts tariffs on, of course, other people will put tariffs on as well. And the the economic dynamism and speed of innovation will be significant slow, significantly slowed. That, of course, is Bill Gates, founder and chair of the Gates Foundation, speaking at the Bloomberg New Economy Forum in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Now, some other stories making the news this Thursday. U.S. officials say North Korea is sending troops to Russia confirming the movements for the first time. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby says about 3,000 North Koreans are training at three sites in Russia. This is a remarkable development, by the way. Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin says there is a serious possibility they will be sent into combat. And Chinese President Xi Jinping and Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi met on the sidelines of the BRICS summit where the two leaders pledged to stabilise relations she said both sides should strengthen cooperation and manage, quote, differences and disagreements. It's their first bilateral meeting since 2022 after easing a four-year border standoff earlier this week. Elsewhere, Turkey says five people have been killed in an attack yesterday on a state-owned defence company in the capital, Ankara. It was the deadliest act of terrorism in Turkey in nearly two years. Officials say the PKK, a Kurdish-backed militant group, was likely behind the assault. Reports say Turkish warplanes later struck Kurdish targets in Iraq and Syria. Hezbollah has confirmed that Hashim Safiuddin, a likely successor to assassinated Chief Hassan Nasrallah, was killed in an Israeli airstrike around three weeks ago. The news is yet another blow to Hezbollah, which has seen almost all its leaders killed by Israeli strikes in recent weeks. Coming up, Equinor says third quarter profit fell after a summer of heavy maintenance weighed on output. We speak to the CEO of the Norwegian energy giant, Anders Oppedal. That is next. This is Bloomberg.
Good morning, this is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. These are the stories that set your agenda. The strike continues. Boeing workers reject the latest wage deal to end a crippling stoppage. The embattled plane maker warns it expects to keep burning cash next year. Tesla shares saw post-market after its most profitable quarter in more than a year. Elon Musk promises ride-sharing services in Texas and California as soon as next year. Plus, a dead heat in the swing states. Our latest poll shows Donald Trump and Kamala Harris neck and neck, less than two weeks from the election. Let's check in on these markets then. The earnings story, of course, front and centre. We saw that lift coming through from the beat around Tesla. Boeing remains a concern, of course, the cash burn into next year and the domestic labour strife as well that continues. And we'll bring you the latest earnings here in Europe as well as and when they cross. Let's check in then. European futures currently down a tenth of a percent. FTSE 100 futures pointing to gains of around 18 points lifted by moves higher in the oil price. S&P futures currently looking to add around two tenths of a percent after the sell-off yesterday in US stocks. Nasdaq futures gaining as well, up four-tenths of a percent, and probably thank Tesla uh, for that move. Again, Nasdaq 100 was down over one percent yesterday by the end of the session, but Tesla coming through with that beat and expected to lift the broader tech sector. Let's flip the board and look cross-asset. The sell-off in the U.S. bond market has eased in the session. Dollar is softer and yields are slightly lower. As you can see, down almost three basis points on the U.S. 10-year at 4.21. Euro dollar currently up a tenth of a percent, largely down to a softer U.S. dollar. We look ahead to PMI data out of France and Germany later in the day. Euro dollar at 107. The pound at 129. Andrew Bailey of the BOE suggesting that inflation and disinflation is moving in the right direction. Moving a little faster maybe than he'd expected. Keeping the door open to further cuts from the Bank of England. 129 on the pound. Brent 75.78 actually up a little over 1% so far in the session. Let's get the latest in terms of the earnings story with a focus on Danone, the yogurt maker of course. Also the producer of water and nutrition products. Coming in with third quarter sales of 6.83 billion euros, just slightly below the estimates in terms of sales. Full year with a projection seeing full year like for like sales an increase of between 3 to 5 percent. That is the expectation for the full year. And in terms of third quarter like for like sales, they came in above the estimates. So like for like sales in the third quarter actually increasing above the estimates. On that line, it was a beat for Danon. 4.2 percent was the increase. The estimates had been for an increase of 3.75 percent. So some lines there crossing on Danon. We'll be watching that stock, of course, at the open. Let's get to the oil and energy space right now because Equinor says third quarter profit fell after a summer of heavy maintenance weighed on output. The Norwegian company is among the first of Europe's major energy producers to report results for the period, which was marked by weak refining margins and volatility in the natural gas market. Equinor CEO Anders Oppedal joins me now. Anders, uh, good morning. Thanks for joining us. So you're coming in with results slightly better than estimates. We, we knew that profit was going to ease on the back of the maintenance season for you. Give us a sense of, of the outlook then and, and your level of confidence, particularly when it comes to the gas part of the business. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, we had a solid result. Um, and uh, when you're talking about the commodity markets and the gas uh, in particular, we saw a 14% increase in the gas prices over uh, this uh, last three uh, uh, months, uh, the, the last quarter. Uh, this is driven by both the demand growth in Asia, but also geopolitical uh, tension. So going forward with a normal winter or a colder winter than normal, we see that the gas storage in Europe will probably be lower next spring than it was this spring, you know, putting a slight upward price uh, pressure on the gas prices uh, in Europe. OK, that's really interesting because inventories in Europe are what, about 95 percent? You think those inter- inventories reduce by, by spring, spring of next year? You talked about the colder weather. That's being forecast by some forecasters. Then, of course, the Middle East tensions, the geopolitical tensions. And just give us a little bit more clarity on, on price and your outlook for gas prices, at least in the near term. It's difficult to say exactly that kind of what, what the gas prices will be, but you know, with with uh, Asia with a healthy demand growth of around three percent on an annual basis, some demand growth in gas in in, in Europe, um, e- even with healthy storage levels, uh, w- there will be competition between Asia and Europe on the spot uh, LNGs. And with uh, normal or cold uh, cold winter, you know, this can put an upward pressure. So this uh, this is the dynamics we see uh, in. Uh, 
the the gas prices. And you see that uh, you know even with healthy storage level, there has been a 14 percent increase over the last uh, three uh, months. So there's uh, it is a pressure on the gas prices as we see it these days. To, to, to the oil business then, Anders, when you see refining margins turning around? Well, that's difficult to see. We see that uh, the market seems to be well supplied, you know, based on uh, both um, uh, some earth certainty on the demand in, in China. Uh, is the OPEC plus, you know, how much holdback will they do? And we see kind of increased uh, supply from, uh, from, from non-OPEC uh, country, which is putting kind of a market which is well supplied and particularly towards the end of uh, 2025. Uh, we are focusing on making sure that we are producing as much as we can uh, with as low break even as possible, safe and efficient uh, operations. And we only have one uh, refinery in our portfolio, so we are less affected by the refinery margin uh, and more exposed to the commodity prices, and particularly with gas. What, what kind of, what, yeah. And as what kind of assumption are you making about oil prices then t- towards year end? Are you looking at a range of kind of 70 to 80 dollar barrel or what, what assumptions are you making around prices as, you, as we get to 20, end, of, end of 2024? I think the range we're seeing now, and we have seen over the, the last uh, last the months, is uh, is uh, the range we will probably see going forward. But it's uh, difficult to predict. There is uh, geopolitical tension. We have the conflict between Iran and Israel, which has the potential to to also increase uh, the the prices if uh, Iranian in oil infrastructure is uh, also included in in the, in the conflict. So setting exactly the price, uh, what it will be, is is difficult. We will see quite a lot of volatility volatility, uncertainty uh, in the oil market going forward. OK. Uh, talk to us about this investment then in Orsted. So you made an almost 10 percent stake. You've taken almost a 10 percent stake in, in the wind farm uh, generator, or at least manager of wind farms, Orsted. What, is that, is that a, a strategic move, Anders? Does that tell us that you're going to be doubling down on renewable energy or is it a tactical move to kind of meet, meet those targets? It's a part of our uh, invest, uh, investment uh, for, for in renewables. We have a very good organic project portfolio that we are investing in. And this is something uh, that we also do in as a counter-cyclical move, investing in a good company, in an industry and a company we know well and an industry we know uh, well. It's a premium uh, portfolio. So it's a part of our renewable uh, strategy, and not an addition, but a part of this uh, this renewable strategy, so we're investing both uh, in a good company. At the same time, we are investing in our own uh, projects as well. And you've set yourself a goal of of having between twelve and sixteen gigawatts in terms of renewable energy online capacity by twenty thirty. Are you going to need to raise capex beyond what you've already guided to meet that goal, Anders? Actually, the, this uh, investment in Ørsted uh, given us, uh, you know, more uh, uh, of this into our portfolio, meaning that we see the capex uh, towards 2030, uh, towards the target of 12 to 16, uh, will uh, will be less. At the same time, uh, the 12 to 16 per, uh, gigawatt targets will only be met if we are finding enough profitable projects to, to invest in. So if we have to choose between the target and profitability, we will always choose profitability. OK, I wonder what, to what extent investors will, will welcome that line then, Anders, because I, I guess there will be some investors out there who said, look, if I, if I want to buy shares in Orsted, I, could, I would just buy directly. I'd, I'd just invest in Orsted. But I've invested in Equinor. So what would you say to those investors who, who may not want to have exposure to the renewable energy story? We're investing in Ørsted. Uh, it's, a, it's a premium portfolio. We are a long-term uh, supportive investor uh, in Ørsted. In, in we are uh, all, always focusing on being uh, a long-term investor with an industrial focus in every investment we're doing to enable to create long-term value for our shareholders. Yeah, I, OK. So I guess in terms of whether or not this is a precursor to, to ramped-up investment around renewables is that is that the signal that we should be taking from this move 
this this move is that uh, we have uh, actually seen that the investment uh, in Ørsted uh, gives a lower investment compared to organic uh, investments in offshore wind at the moment. So we see this as a counter-cyclical uh, move. And this also means that uh, to meet the targets, we can invest less CAPEX towards 2030. OK, less CAPEX towards, towards 2030, depending on some of those metrics. Uh, Anders, before we let you go, how's the LNG uh, trading team doing? What, what is your outlook in terms of uh, the LNG trading business, which, of course, has its own volatility? Well, you see the volatility, and that means that uh, there are arbitrage uh, to be, be made. And this quarter, we have uh, made uh, quite a lot of profit also with uh, LNG trade, uh, trading, uh, also by uh, moving gas between the different uh, hubs uh, in, in Europe for the, 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 the pipe gas. So the volatil- we are enabled to, to use this volatility to increase the earnings uh, of the company. Okay, so the arbitrage around the volatility in the LNG space. Equinox CEO Anders Oppedel, thank you very much indeed for your time on the back of the earnings coming through, of course, for that Norwegian oil and gas major. We appreciate it. Now, some other stories making news this Thursday. Also on the earnings front, very different sector, of course. French fashion group Kering warns that its annual profit will slump to the lowest since 2016 as weak Chinese demand hampers its biggest label. Gucci, Kering expects only $2.7 billion in recurring operating income below analyst expectations. Comparable sales at Gucci slumped 25% in the third quarter. Caring ADRs fell on the news. Intesa Sao Paulo is planning for 9,000 staff exits by 2027. That's after Italy's biggest bank struck an accord with the country's trade union as it seeks to boost profitability and curb expenses. The reductions comprise 7,000 staff in Italy and 2,000 in the bank's international divisions. German Finance Minister Christian Linder has urged the European Union to abandon its goal of effectively phasing out the combustion engine in just over a decade. Speaking to us in New York, he also ruled out further subsidies to help his country's car makers compete with Chinese electric vehicles. The end of the combustion engine in uh, 2035 is not only too early, I think we do not need um, uh, that date. We should be uh, open for all technologies, and even the combustion engine is possible to uh, be used uh, climate neutral yeah. with synthetic fuels. Coming up, Dassault Systems cuts its full year guidance. We're going to speak exclusively to the CEO of the French technology group that is next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Now, Dassault Systems has cut its non-IFRS revenue forecast at constant currencies for the full year. The French tech company is citing the continued scrutiny and contraction of the auto market. Joining me now is Pascal Dalloz, the CEO of Dassault Systems. Pascal, thanks so much for coming to the studio. There's a number of challenges for this space then. We're thinking about potential tax increases coming through from the French government, talking about the geopolitics, of course, political uncertainty in the US, the challenges around the aerospace industry. We've been talking about Boeing this morning, autos. What is the biggest challenge for, for this business at the moment? I think we, if you look at what uh, Q3 is telling us, the auto sector is probably where we have the exposure, uh, especially in Europe, because, uh, as you know, we have uh, 25% of the revenue coming from the auto sector. So with these new uh, competitions coming from China, I think this is putting this industry under pressure. How long does that last? It started, uh, I mean... The, turn, the turning point was during the summertime. I think we, we were anticipating some pressure, but not at this level. Mm. And you expect that pressure to continue in 2025 yes. when it comes to the auto sector? That's the point, yes. OK, through 2025? No, I think, uh, again, we, we, we have solutions also to handle this, uh, this topic. And I think this is also putting pressure on certain of our customers to make some choices. And this is opening some opportunity also for us. So... As usual in the crisis, you have good and bad. And the good is, I think this is forcing certain customers to make decisions 
And I think we have the solutions for that. OK, talk to us about aerospace and defence then, another big unit for you and the business. You've guided that maybe some big deals will be coming through, North America and Europe. Yeah. Are, you, are you starting to push through some of those big deals in the aerospace? Yeah, we, we, have, we, we signed some during the Q3, especially mm -hmm. in the defence sector in the US. Uh, by the way, this sector is extremely resilient for us. Uh, we are still growing a high single digit and we have good perspective until the end of the year. And growth for that sector in 2025, what's that looking at? Same high, high single digit? Yeah, maybe double. Double yeah. because as you mentioned, we have large deals in the pipe and they will contribute anyway uh, this year, but probably more next year in 2025. Okay, possibly double digit then when it comes to aerospace and defence and that unit in 2025. Boeing. The impact from that company, we're reminded again of the struggles. How, how much of a drag is Boeing for you? I think Boeing, uh, as you may know, we have a long-standing relationship with them. Uh, we signed this partnership for the next 30 years, and we are the commitment for them to deploy our solutions. So the topic for them is really how to transfer the knowledge and the know-how to the workers. This is the big topic. And our solution is really playing a critical role to help them fix this. And you cut across, the business cuts across many different segment, customer segments. So we've been talking about some of the biggest conglomerates, the biggest names in the space. But you also, of course, supply to small and medium-sized enterprises. Given the macroeconomic backdrop, slowing growth, are you seeing a pullback? Are you seeing caution amongst those smaller customers? In aerospace and defense, the answer is no. And you know the reason why is because whatever you take, Boeing, Airbus, all the different uh, companies, they have huge backlogs to produce. And the topic for them is much more how to accelerate the ramp up in order to deliver the order book. Mm. So this has a positive impact on the supply chain. OK, what about large pharma and, and smaller biotech? What, what, is the out, what is the outlook there? I think we, we are going much better. Uh, you remember we have, I call it the COVID bubble. Yeah. Because we have so much money being spent that we had a lot of new trials starting at that time. So we had a contraction the last uh, 18 months. Now we are back to the normal. And it's visible in our result because we have a sequential improvement. OK, so back to normal when it comes to pharma and biotech. What does that normal look like in terms of in terms The normal of revenue for, growth? The, for the market, it's plus 5. Plus 5% 5 growth? Right. Yes. And you see that continuing next year? Yeah. yeah. OK. Um, how are you thinking about taxes? The French government's going to have to raise <laughs> taxes. You're in, the, you're in the target, aren't you? Whether it's corporate taxes yeah. or but it's still in share discussion. buybacks. It's still in discussion, right? OK. Have you been but lobbying the government? Of course. <laughs> of course. But the maximum impact for us will be uh, slightly below 20 million. OK. 20, so you're factoring in a 20 million euro hit as a result of this tax increase. And you expect it to come through? I, we don't know yet, but at least we are prepared for this. The most important for us, I think, is to keep the tax credit for the research and development. Uh, I don't know if you have seen yeah. the Draghi report. He's mentioning that uh, Europe needs to continue to invest massively in the tech sector. So I think uh, it's in the benefit for all the people to find some incentives. Have you, have you been reassured that the tax credit for R&D will be kept? That's, uh, this is my push right now. That's your push? <laughs> yes. That's your push. And you're, you're hopeful on that yeah, front. Yeah. Okay, yeah. what's happening in China? There's, there's, there's some stimulus that's come through from the government. Are you seeing that filtering through? Is it too yeah. early? Are you starting to see that impact? No, China is going well for us. We are growing double digits, massively driven by the auto sector, as you could imagine. And as you say, uh, the government is investing a lot of, to not only on the manufacturing side, but also on the innovation side. And we are benefiting from this. You are benefiting from that. Are you seeing the impact of, of the stimulus part? Or is that, is, is that it's less? It's starting to be visible. You're yes. starting to see the impact of that stimulus in terms of the pickup. And so you expect 2025 to be strong in terms of the China market for you. Um, what's the AI play for data ah. systems? Well, you know, it's part of our DNA. Uh, because for the last 40 years, what do we do? We are combining modeling and simulations yeah. with data. And the AI is a way to elevate the data into knowledge and know-how. So that's what we do. Um, the reality, it's more and more used for us to give a very advanced capability to the non-experts. That's a real, that's, this is really where we see most of the benefits mm -hmm. of the AIs. Okay. Um, are you integrating it in your business as well? Is it going to create efficiencies across Dassault systems? Does oh. it mean you can keep a cap on headcount? Of course, of course. Uh, knowing that, uh, you know, at Dassault systems, uh, we are not hiring people knowing how to develop the code only. We are hiring people who knows how to design a car, a plane, a drugs. And to a certain extent, the AI is, comp is helping them to accelerate the efficiency when you have to write the code. But does it mean five years down the line you have a smaller labor force? No, not at all. Not at all. It's a way to, to do more with the current capacity we have. 
Okay, Pascal. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You. Pascal Delos, the CEO of Dassault Systems, on the back of the earnings story there. Some optimism around the prospects around China. The challenges for the auto market of Europe, though, and to what extent that's playing through for the provider of crucial software, of course, for a number of these industrials and sectors. Uh, Pascal, thank you. Now, Bloomberg recently launched the weekend edition, going deeper into context of stories that shape markets and the world. You can scan the QR code on the screen to subscribe to the newsletter. We'll hold this up for you so you can get the phones out and scan that QR code. Well worth doing. There's plenty more coming up. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. As a result of a long period of uh, zero to negative inflation, uh, inflation expectations have been changing very, very slowly. And that was, in a sense, uh, lucky for us uh, in our attempt to normalize policy, although it's, it's still uh, taking time for us to uh, get to 2%. Okay, Bank of Japan Governor Kazuo Ueda speaking there. We've had a reminder this week that we should not dismiss what's happening in the yen because the volatility, and this is on a one-week and two-week implied basis on the yellow and white line, has picked up significantly. Further conversation again coming back to the fore around whether or not the Ministry of Finance has to intervene. There's a bit of a relief for the yen today in the session because you've had softer dollar, but we're leading up to a general election, really important, of course, in Japan this weekend. Expectations the ruling party wins, but maybe their power base shrinks. Investors increasingly expecting that the BOJ will go again with a hike, possibly in December, if not in the early part of the year. But, of course, part of that decision will come down to the expectations around the Federal Reserve. And those, of course, have been readdressed recently. But just a reminder of the volatility in the yen that we've seen. Close to a three-month low versus the US dollar, although that has come back a little bit in the session today. Let's check in on the luxury space. We saw that warning coming through again from Kering, the owner of Gucci. Really, really tough times. Part of that blame can be laid at the door of China. Almez is later uh, today. They're going to be reporting earnings. They have had that resilience. Their shares have outperformed. This is the white line, Almez versus the broader luxury space. They've outperformed because they've had that resilience. Does that continue or are they starting to feel the pain of the China pullback? That is a key corporate story for us today on the luxury space. At 1.15 p.m. UK time to speak to German Bundesbank President Joachim Nagel at the IMF. The opening trade is next, though. This is Bloomberg.